David the Good, and today we are going to put in our fall garden. It is a nice, crisp, cool morning here in southern Alabama, and yesterday we got the area behind me tilled up again. Well, I got it tilled up, but I had a couple of kids sitting on my lap, so tilled this whole area behind me, and that was the second time, so the weeds and the grass should be mostly taken care of, and it's time to make this area into beds and start planting. So I'm going to enjoy the cool weather and start gardening. This is cotton seed meal. We're in cotton country, and cotton seed meal is a is a good uh, nitrogen source, sort of a slow release nitrogen source. Some people would consider it organic, and I've talked to you guys about the problems between, you know, is it organic or is it chemical, and which one is safer for your garden? Because you know you can get there could be pesticide residues and. It's GMO and all that crazy stuff. And that may or may not matter. You know, and you could you could weigh it out and say, well, if you put chemical fertilizer on there, that's probably uh, just made in a laboratory, so it's maybe it's got less contaminants than using an organic amendment. You know, so the whole the whole <laughs> organic versus chemical thing is ridiculous and complicated. But what I do know is that this stuff grows some amazing cabbages and I have used it before. It's recommended by Steve Solomon in his complete organic fertilizer mix COF and uh, I tested that some years ago and I found man that cottonseed meal it doesn't burn stuff but it it makes the plants very very happy and since it's cheap and abundant and it's not full of chemical salts that are just going to leach out and it's adding a little uh, organic matter to the soil. I'm happy to use it because I really want to grow some cabbages over this fall and winter. One great thing about the cottonseed meal as opposed to you know using a chemical fertilizer is the cottonseed meal really feeds the life in the ground, feeds the worms, feeds the microorganisms, and as they live and eat and excrete and die and decay, that adds more life to your gardens. Right down the middle. That's where the cabbages go. Dr. Seuss's, where do the cabbages go? To and fro and fro and to, do 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 two by two, the cabbages, cabbages, cabbages go. Well, where are those cabbages, cabbages go? They go here, they go there. Cabbages going everywhere. 
cabbages in great straight lines. Cabbages, cabbages, all of them mine. So I'm putting a row of cabbages, mostly directly down the middle of this one. And I like to do it this way. I should be using a hammer, but instead of using my 24 inch spacer stick incorrectly, but I like to I like to hammer something into the ground. You can use the back of a you know a rake handle or a hoe handle or whatever to do this with. But if you knock a little row into the ground, it both marks where you can put your seeds, and it helps create capillary action. If you've gone to the beach and you know stepped in the sand and you've seen how the water fills up those areas or how it gets darker in the areas that you stepped, that's capillary action. That's the water being pulled upwards into an area that's been depressed. So we're not smacking the living daylights out of the ground, you know, all over and pressing out all the hard work we did to fluff this bed up, but we are smacking it down a little here so it stays a little moister, a little moist underneath the seeds. Yeah, that's cool. So the center is now planted with cabbages, plenty of space, and I'm going to put a row of carrots on either side, which shouldn't interfere with the cabbages too much. So on this other bed here, the previous one is carrots. This one is going to be salad radishes. And out in the field, I'm going to plant daikon radishes, but they take up a lot more space. So these little salad radishes will be up and out of here pretty quickly before, you know, before anything happens with the cabbages. Like 28 days, 30 days, 32 days. Radishes are very fast if they're happy. Bed number one has cabbages and two rows of radishes. Bed number two has cabbages down the middle with two rows of carrots. And I am totally tired of planting things appropriately and, and, and being fiddly about spacing. It drives me nuts. And so this next bed, I'm gonna throw these southern peas on here. And we are out of cottonseed meal. So this is going to add nitrogen. I don't care, these things can just sprout in here. And I know you're thinking, oh, these are all gonna die. Because isn't it the fall? Aren't you in zone 8B? Yes, I'm in zone 8B, and they will die. It's too late in the year to do this. If I wanted to actually grow black-eyed peas, but I don't. What I'm doing is taking a couple buck bag of dry beans from the grocery store and turning it into maybe 10 or 20 bucks worth of nitrogen in the ground. I don't know, what's this organic nitrogen worth? But this, this is just gonna grow and be a green cover crop. You know what, I'll do this one too. Why not? Now if I wanted them to stay alive, if I wanted something that was actually gonna produce through the winter, I would plant peas at this point, or lentils, or even chickpeas will take some cold, fava beans, that kind of thing, for nitrogen fixation through the winter. But I, I actually want these to grow for a while and then freeze and leave their nitrogen behind in the soil along with the root mass and the tops which are going to rot back down into the ground amidst 
the other things that I'm going to plant in between in just a second. Now what I'm doing is scattering some daikon radish seeds. These I actually want to eat, but they're also ground busters. If, if you have hard ground, you could just scatter these guys. But I am putting way too many of these seeds. I gotta thin out a little bit. They need space and they get big. So it's not too much here. We're kind of doing a mini food forest out here. Like imagine an annual kind of a mix. We'll let everything fill in the different gaps in space. Some things will go up and be nitrogen fixtures. Some things will be a little shorter. It's kind of fun. Just scatter a few. I'm not too excessive. I need some to throw out in my field. That was way easier. That was way easier than actually measuring and doing it properly. Let's see what we get. Now I've got some sugar snap peas, and I'm also gonna do these inappropriately. I'm just gonna scatter a few through here. Get a few peas here and there. I don't know if these are the climbing ones or not. Most of them are. I don't have anything for them to climb on, but if they start to annoy me and they don't produce much, again, they fix nitrogen, so I just cut them down and feed them to something else. This is a chop and drop garden bed here. This is dwarf Siberian kale, which is, kale is one of those real nice, cold hardy greens that goes right through the winter. You can sometimes get kale to go through the winter, you know, even zone six. Zone seven. Here it's a cinch. And it's very good for you. And when we get chickens, the kale is really good for making those yolks turn nice and dark orange. It's very, very healthy for chickens and it's healthy for you. If you don't like kale, just feed it to your chickens and eat the eggs. Eggs are probably better for you than kale anyways. I'm planting mustard and my daughter is planting lettuces. Again, we're just doing the crazy sprinkle thing and if stuff is too thick, we chop it and drop it and feed it to the other stuff. The seed, I mean, I think it was like 50 cents for enough mustard seed to plant like five beds, so it's not like it's a it's a big deal. If you buy your seed in bulk, you can just throw it around and it's not a waste. It's all gonna feed the ground and, and you're gonna end up eating a lot of it because you can thin these mustards and pull them out when they're small. And of course, there's always these lettuces which we can eat all the time, as much as we want. And even little baby ones, we can pull out and eat. This is crimson clover, another nitrogen fixer, just for the heck of it. Why not? You would normally do this in a field, but I just want to watch it grow. So I'm putting it in my garden. So now I have a mix of some turnips, daikons, carrots, whatever. Throwing them all over this bed. Look at this, it kind of looks cool. These fluorescent blue things are some sort of a, a hybrid turnip. It's probably evil gen mod. No, it's not. I'm not ruining my brand. So hybrid is not a gen mod. If you read my books, you understand that hybrids and gen mods are different things. We don't do gen mod, but hybrids, eh, if you don't worry about saving seeds, which I'm not going to do on turnips, it's no big deal. It just means you get a consistent result. So, speaking of consistent results, let me just keep throwing stuff randomly over these beds. I'm not going to put peas on these. I don't know what the peas are going to do, if they're going to sprawl all over the place or whatever. And so I put peas on the other ones. 
this has some you know turnips and carrots and other stuff mixed into it but I am throwing these black eyed black eyed peas on here which are a bean and again they're gonna die with the frost my other nitrogen fixer for the winter in these beds is the clover so this is going to be the the quick dieback and we will just totally see what happens we did two beds really nicely well organized perfectly spaced and then we did this so this this is the this is the fun part I was, I was just telling Rachel I don't have the patience I don't really want to space everything appropriately through all of these beds it's much more fun to just throw seeds all over the place and see what happens now I, I will space out some stuff appropriately back here this is all gonna get perfect single rows of stuff but not today today I'm playing around and with these small intense beds I'm gonna make them really nice crazy polycultures and we'll just sort of select and thin as we go and it, and it looks really cool just wait in a few weeks it's gonna be amazing if I had some safe hay or straw that I could trust that I knew wasn't sprayed with herbicides or something or if I had some grass clippings it would be a good time to throw that down over this to be a little more cover than just raking everything in but I don't have that so we're just going with the rake kind of rake hope we're covering a, a good amount of the seeds which we should be and then we'll keep it watered so the ones that are closer to the surface should be fine to be able to do what they what they need to do to germinate the the difficulty is when when seeds are just starting to germinate that's when they're 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 very at risk for drying out especially in this sandy soil so you get a really hot dry day or just a windy even a windy cool day it's sunny this stuff all dries out and so the new roots if they're right on the surface it's like the parable of the sower where the seeds that fall on the uh, the thin rocky ground they germinate really quickly but when the Sun comes up they dry up because they don't have any decent roots there's nothing to keep them grounded so that's that's when they're risky. Once they get their roots in the ground, they can go much longer in between watering. Let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five beds planted. Not bad for one day. It helped that we had a, uh, a tractor to loosen and get all the ground down. And these first two beds are the ones that are real nice perfect rows which all of you neurotic viewers will appreciate all the engineers all the autistic people you will love this this is this is for you I did this for you because I love you uh, and then for the anarchists we've got a few more beds down here that are not well organized and we're just gonna really kind of just see how it works out on both there is definitely some value to putting things in nice rows because it makes weeding way way easier you put a little bit more effort on the front end of things to take less effort out of the back end of things but oh, there you go I just got bored had to scatter some seeds around again but over the next uh, few weeks, of course, I'll be doing updates, and hopefully this set of gardens sticks longer than my last few sets of gardens. I was telling Rachel, I said, you know, I keep starting gardens. Hey, guess what I'm doing? I'm starting a new garden, and then, then end up moving. So, uh, hopefully, you know, we get a nice, good, long fall garden season, and there's, I don't think there's any reason that I'm going to move this time. I'm very happy here and it's it's nice and peaceful and I really like sandy soil and the mosquitoes are slower here than they were in the Caribbean so all is good I'll get some irrigation out here you know doing this hose thing is not the best and we'll just watch and see how it goes 
it's going to be beautiful and I hope you guys that are in a mild enough climate are getting a chance to put in some fall gardens. I highly recommend putting in a nice big fall garden. It's a good idea in uncertain times and it's a good idea if you care about your family's nutrition. It's a good idea if you want some stress relief and you need something to go out and do to get you out of you know, your, your endless business Zoom calls and all that nonsense. So if you can't do it yourself, at least you can join me in my garden anytime you want to. And I'll catch you all soon. I appreciate you joining me today and we're just gonna have fun experimenting together. And of course, until next time, may your thumbs always be green. Come on, man. Come on, man. You know, the thing. <laughs>